After the nuclear fallout of the Great War, the lucky residents that had managed to make it to the allocated vaults across the United States of America were led to believe that they would now be safe and protected from the broken world beyond their vault door. With many of the vaults having been constructed in preparation for such a disastrous event, the bright minds behind the construction of the safe havens, Vault Tech, had ulterior motives on how these vaults full of prime candidates for experiments could be used to potentially set up a better future for humanity. With many of the vaults having later been discovered to have tortured the population within, each vault had their own unique horrors and circumstances that all left an interesting story to discover. Within the east of the capital wasteland, one vault suffered mass casualties to one of the scenarios after those inside of their vault attempted to play God. Who lived within this vault? What was its purpose? And how did this experiment end? Here we explore, in the lore behind, the Vault of Gary, Vault 108. With tensions between the United States of America and China rising to the point where the population feared a great war, vault Tech Industries, a pre-war defense corporation, was commissioned by the US government to construct bunkers across the entirety of America. These bunkers would be designed to be capable of housing up to 500 people within them, as well as protecting them from most of the dangers that came from a potential nuclear fallout. With each bunker being capable of keeping the population of America safe within them, they were named vaults and subsequently listed in numerical order of their creation. As the tensions continued to rise between the nations, vault stocks increased massively, and reservations to live within these vaults continued to grow with each day as an uncertain future spread fear across the nation. While these vaults, to the government and to the population of America, were advertised as a place of safe haven in the event a great war did begin, they were not aware of the nefarious plan that vault actually had for them. As the vaults were constructed, the company planned for 17 of them to be control vaults, vaults where the population within would live as had been advertised by vault -Tec. But for all of the other vaults, vault -Tec had planned to use those that inhabited them in experiments. They believed that the results of these experiments would, in the long run, aid humanity in its future scientific endeavors and help redefine society after its fall. The loss of human life during these would be seen as nothing more than a small admission for greatness. In 2061, vault -Tec began construction on yet another vault, Vault 108, located near to a small town just north of Washington, D.C. This vault would not be a safe haven, and the planned experiment would leave all of those subjected to the horrors within void of this world. During its eight-year development, which ended in 2069 due to a work stoppage, the incomplete structure was advertised to house 475 occupants for a total of 38 years. With vault having their own plans for this vault, they set up various scenarios that would act as triggers to activate their plan. In its construction, the company chose not to implement a computer control system which were normally integral to the running of a vault. For power, they decided to use a General Atomics branded nuclear power system for the primary power supply and a Steam Whistle branded mini geothermal unit for the secondary power supply. Although this would, on paper, appear to have the ability to power the vault for the 38 year timeframe, the normally reliable primary power supply was designed to fail after only 20 years. After the failure of this device, the mini geothermal unit would only power the vault partially, leaving sections of the vault either partly usable or even completely inaccessible. As these vaults were being designed to keep the residents within safe, at least from outside forces, Vault 108 was fitted with triple the normal amount of weaponry, which could at first glance be thought to be used against any invaders. But 
If these weapons were to land in the wrong hands, they could cause an issue within the vault itself. While the vault did have an immense amount of weaponry, it was designed to lack any entertainment that the other vaults were given, leaving a potential for the members within to grow extremely bored over the years. With every vault, there needs to be an overseer to not only guide the population within, but also to follow through with the plans that vault -Tec had put in place for the location. With this, Brody Jones was selected to become the overseer of Vault 108. While Brody would believe he had been chosen because of vault belief in him to lead those that came under his care, the Shady Corporation had actually become aware from a pre-assigned medical test that Brody had a genetic disposition for a rare strain of cancer. With this strain, they predicted Brody to fall to the illness within just over three years of Vault 108's use. In most of the vaults constructed across America, vault Tech would standardly assign roles to all of the residents so that they could contribute to the running of their new society. But, with this being one of vault Tech's experimental scenarios, they purposely gave orders to Brody to select which resident had which position following the Vault 108 protocols available to him. Although he had almost full control of which role the residents did, vault Tech did select three of them for him. The first, Nathan Oregon as the morale officer, the second being Jarek Maddox as the chief of security, and finally, Zachary K. Jameson as the chief of staff. With Brody believing his role in this vault to simply watch over those that came in and follow the Vault 108 protocols to select how each member of the vault could contribute to their society, it seemed that this vault would ride out a nuclear fallout in safety, but vault -Tec had other plans in mind. With Brody estimated to pass away within the next three years and the residents not being given an actual role, the residents of Vault 108 would be in for a traumatic ride. As the vault doors closed and Vault 108 became fully functional, Brody Jones had the tough task of assigning those now under his care to the various sectors required in a society. Likely having their information supplied by vault -Tec, he assigned the population based on their education level, their history, as well as their word. Upon learning more about them, Brody would assign the residents to sectors such as maintenance, academia, and communications. After three years of living within the small vault due to it never having officially been completed as a result of the worker shortage, as predicted, Brody passed away from his rare strain of cancer. Although this would have normally been a sad moment after losing a leader, his demise created a power vacuum within Vault 108, leaving those with ambition to attempt to take his spot. Alongside this, some of the residents discovered vault true purpose and experiment for the vault, a cloning lab. With scientists having been based within the facility, they took it upon themselves to make use of the cloning equipment. Without an overseer to manage them, they had no restrictions to the lengths they would go. As the real experiment began, the scientists within Vault 108, through an unknown selection process, chose the test subject a resident called Gary. Using this equipment, the first cloning trial was successful. Upon testing with the clone, they found that he showed slight aggression towards those around him. Pushing forward, the scientists continued to clone Gary repeatedly, resulting in many variations of the same man now limited to the cloning facility. As each Gary was successfully cloned, they each showed an additional level of hostility and aggression than the last. It appeared to the scientists that these dangerous traits were only aimed at the non-clones they came across. As the experiment went on, each cloning process added more risk to the scientists and the environment around them. With each Gary having been held in a containment cell, their numbers were rising to the point of a small army and if they were to somehow be set free due to a potential power failure, they could potentially wreak havoc on the non-clones of Vault 108. 
continuing to clone Gary. They hoped that they could discover a way to remove the now extreme aggression, but their efforts failed. With each clone, they also noticed that although they all had the same appearance of Gary, their cognitive function seemed to lack the ability to betray what they were thinking and feeling. The scientists remarked that their extremely limited vocabulary consisted of simply saying their name, Gary, in various inflections depending on the situation they were in. By the time the scientists reached Gary 53, they had begun to run out of space in the observation rooms to store the clones. With this, they sought out ways in which to dispose of those they no longer required. As they moved on to clone 54, the aggression levels of the Garys had exceeded to the point that during his examination with one of the doctors, Dr. Peterson, Gary 54 successfully attacked him, resulting in the first known injury of the experiment. With these clear psychotic traits and levels of hostility also found within the other clones, the scientists decided to destroy the Gary clones to not only make room for more tests in the future, but to also provide a safer working environment. While this was the plan, it seemed that this would not be as easy as planned, and although they were unaware, the fall of Vault 108 had already begun, leaving the scientists and the other non-clone residents within the communal areas with limited days to live. With a plan of action to destroy the current Gary clones, in an unknown circumstance, the Gary clones somehow managed to get out of their containment, with the power supply having been scheduled to fail within 20 years of the vault's activation, it is speculated that this was the cause. With their brutal and psychotic nature, the surviving Gary clones of the Gary Purge then viciously murdered the scientists that had created them, and then moved on to the populated areas of the vault full of non-clones. In their numbers, the army of Garys managed to use the mass amount of weaponry held around the vault to massacre all of the non-clones, even the original Gary, who, while he did resemble them, was not a clone. He was simply the first of the Garys. With only the Garys now left in Vault 108, they wandered it, shouting out into the distance in the language of Gary. Each Gary call with a different inflection representing a different meaning that only another Gary could understand. As the years passed, the vault around them began to rust due to water leaks. With no one to maintain and clean the vault, the degradation of Vault 108 led the sections to collapse, leaving less room for the Garys to wander. It appeared that as time passed over the next century, a side effect of the cloning process had left the remaining Gary clones immune to the aging process that would have, at this point, normally had them grow old and move on. As the vaults began to open across the wasteland, new factions and communities grew from the surviving members of their respective vaults. With the planned 38 years now well and truly passed, the large door of Vault 108 opened wide to the dangers of the wasteland. Now with the door open, the clones had the option to continue to live within the vault that they had taken from the original dwellers, or branch out into the dangerous land. With the entrance of the vault openly available, it gave the population of the wasteland the opportunity to enter Vault 108 and seek out the treasures within. For any raider that did test their luck and venture inside to seek out any valuables, they would hear the name Gary called out various times ominously in the distance. That was, until they met the population saying it. As the raiders reached further inside of the vault, one by one, they would meet their end at the hands of the brutal Gary clones within. By 2276, running into 2277, various factions had formed across the wasteland, one of these being members of the Brotherhood Outcasts who had formed only recently in 2276. This group had once been a part of the Brotherhood of Steel within the capital wasteland, 
but after a group of them began to openly oppose the ideologies and vision that the current elder of the order held, Elder Lions, they left the group and established their own rebel faction. Within their outpost, the Outcast Outpost, the members of the Order had a mission to access a simulation pod, but to do this, they required the use of a Pip-Boy 3000. With this, they raided the region of Vault 108 and successfully kidnapped one of the dwellers they came across, Gary 23. Taking him back to the Outcast Outpost, they attempted to have Gary access the simulation pod for them, but his hostility and inability to communicate left them frustrated. As beating did not work as well as they wanted, they resorted to amputating his arm to take the device, which in turn resulted in his death. Unknown to the members of this order, the death of the person wearing the device also resulted in the deactivation of it, leaving their attempts in vain and one more of the limited Gary clones dead. With this vault now solidified as one of the more dangerous regions of the capital wasteland, the Garys within would soon meet their match in 2277 when a new person would come to explore the secrets of Vault 108. Exploring just outside of the location now known as Canterbury Comets, a young escapee of Vault 101 had travelled the Capital Wasteland on their plan to discover not only the mystery of their father's disappearance, but also the many secrets that the land held. Discovering the entrance of Vault 108 wide open, they entered. Upon wandering down the dark, degraded tunnels, the lone wanderer could hear the calls of the Gary clones inside. As they ventured further in, they discovered just how far this vault had fallen and how different it was to their own. With mole rats having made their home in the entrance, dead raiders' bodies left out on display, and various skeletons and carcasses scattered around, this place had seen much anguish. Discovering the Garys within, the Wanderer was attacked in waves as they came across them. After being attacked by each Gary, the lone wanderer found most of them to be unarmed, with a few wielding pistols, knives and lead pipes. Furthermore, the lone wanderer discovered only 12 living of the known 54 Garys that had been created. It seemed that as time had passed, these clones had either vacated the vault or simply fallen to the degradation of their environment. With only three locations of the vault accessible at this point, the Lone Wanderer discovered the mole rat infested entrance, the living quarters in a state of disrepair. The cafeteria appeared to have not been used in a long time and had now been infested with rad roaches. The path to the reactor and female dorms completely barricaded and unable to pass. And finally, the cloning facility. Inside of the cloning lab, the Wanderer discovered the body of a victim of the Gary clones placed upon an examination table. Although the Garys did lack the ability to articulate what they were thinking or feeling, it could have been possible that with this body, they had attempted their own experiment. Having grown up in a vault themselves, the lone wanderer noticed that the window of this vault's out-of-reach overseer office, formerly inhabited by Brody Jones, had a completely different shaped window to that of their own vault with this one being rectangle in comparison to the regular circle-shaped windows that they had discovered on their path since leaving Vault 101. Attempting to put the pieces together of Vault 108, and now, with the entire vault lifeless after the Lone Wanderer's final purge of the Gary clones within, the Wanderer left the vault. Without the danger within, this place could now become a safe haven from the harsh realities of the outside world without a dangerous Gary in sight. It is unknown if this was the ending that vault had envisioned for their cloning experiment in Vault 108, but it surely would have made a huge difference to the population of the wasteland if this technique had, in fact, 
perfectly cloned the individuals into working members of society instead of the homicidal, rage-fueled Gary army that swarmed the non-clone members of Vault 108. Regardless, this experiment showed just how wrong one of vault experiments could go. Or maybe this was their plan all along. As the Lone Wanderer had murdered all of the Gary clones within, they had in fact ended what was left of the experiment. But although the clones inside of Vault 108 are dead, there may still be other clones living out there in the wasteland that had left before the Lone Wanderer visited. With the overall plan for Vault 108 having been corrupted over the years, only those that came up with them would know what was to be estimated from this and if they still live within a safe vault, perhaps they can divulge their findings to the world in the future. While this experiment in itself was extremely disturbing, there are still other vaults out there in the capital wasteland with their own horrors, even worse than those that had occurred within Vault 108. With these experiments, the question does have to be asked, are these psychological, horrendous and borderline evil acts that have been committed within these vaults worth the results that vault believed could somehow help redefine society after the nuclear fallout? With the wasteland continuing to be populated by the vaults opening up across the nation, the surviving members of these vaults can tell their stories. But without the personnel of vault still not having made their presence known in America by 2287, maybe they had died out too and these awful experiments had all been for nothing. Vault 108 was absolutely amazing to explore. Hearing the distant calls of <laughs> Gary from the homicidal Garys in combination with the dark lighting and long hallways really set the tone for the vault and the environment. What I love about the world building and storytelling of Bethesda is that they place pieces of the events that have happened within the location and then, as a player, you have to explore these locations and put the pieces together to create a cohesive story. The great thing about Vault 108 is that during my first playthrough and discovery of the vault, I was always very confused on why there were so many people called Gary in one vault, and I later went on to think that vault just selected people that were called Gary to be put into the vault and basically fight to become the best Gary. And while that thought was brutal, it simply was not as dark as the reality of the failed cloning experiment. This was a great video for me to begin this lore series, as I could easily give a bit of a background on the world, vault and a fairly tame vault story in comparison to the absolutely messed up ones in the series. The Vault of Gary is, and always will be, one of my favourites. The name Gary will never be the same for me going forward. Overall, and I guess in summary, I really enjoyed putting this together, as I got to explore a whole new universe in depth. As much as I love Half-Life and Fable, Fallout just has that quirkiness that the other two lack. I feel good about this series and I cannot wait to explore more of the universe for the unique and quirky stories that could only happen in the Fallout series. That was the story and the lore behind Vault 108, also known as the Vault of Gary in Fallout. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a like and a comment on your thoughts. If you really liked it, then go ahead and subscribe. Interacting in any way will help the video with the algorithm, so give it a like, a dislike, and a share if you want to show your Fallout communities. If you would like to stay up to date with everything I do outside of YouTube and fancy some behind the scenes content, then go and follow my Twitter and Instagram, linked below. Finally, I would like to thank my patrons who are helping to support the channel. I really appreciate you. Thank you to the old gods. Talus, Detroit, AVWV, Brunette Janas, Jojo Scotia, Imaginary Holly, Ruben Mendoza, and Putpa. I would also like to give an extra special thank you to the Elder Ones tier, Jonas, Lewis, and Queen Arby. Thank you guys so much. With Patreon, the old gods get access to scripts, screenshots, and general behind the scenes content when I'm putting the videos together. The Elder Ones get access to videos about a week before they post here. There's Discord tiers and other perks too. It also helps support myself and the channel. 
what did you think of this lore video? For me, Vault 108 was absolutely one of the most interesting vaults in the Capital Wasteland. It also shows how twisted and manipulative vault actually were. Which was your favourite vault? Would you have survived the army of Garys as they flooded the vault? And what do you think vault true aim of this experiment was? Let me know in the comments below. If you have any suggestions for future Fallout lore videos, please let me know. As this was the first one, I was happy to take suggestions, and I'm glad I did. I knew I wanted to start with a video about a vault, and so I asked in the community tab, and after looking at your answers, I had so many of your favourites to choose from. The next few videos I am thinking about are maybe other vaults, maybe vault Tech themselves, or our favourite guy Preston Garvey. Another settlement needs your help. Any suggestions are welcome. That was everything I wanted to cover in this episode. Now Wastelander, enjoy your day, and remember to always store an extra stim pack. Bye. Gary!